Welcome to those of you that joined us. My name is Day, my pronouns are she, her, and we'd like to start today with a land acknowledgement. While you may be joining us from all over the world, today we are here in London, Ontario. We acknowledge the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapawak, and Atawandaran peoples, whose traditional lands we are gathered upon today. Welcome, we are so excited to have you here today for our Faculty of Arts and Humanities event. Before I go through the itinerary for tonight, let's go through a few housekeeping items. First, we are recording this session. It will be available on our website in a few days. It will be on the same page you went to for registration, welcome.uwo.ca slash presentations. Next, we've enabled live closed captioning for this webinar. If you'd like to turn it on, you'll find the live transcript button on the button bar. Then you can choose show subtitle. A box will appear and you can put it wherever you want on your screen. The other option is to choose view full transcript and the transcript will pop up in a sidebar. Just remember, it is live closed captioning so I cannot guarantee the total accuracy. Next, your video and audio will remain off but that does not mean we won't be interacting with you today. We will have polls all throughout the event and we also wanna answer all your questions. You can submit a question using the Q&A box. You'll also find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can enter questions now, you can enter questions all throughout the event and whenever you think of them. I'm joined with a lot of friends and colleagues from Western tonight, staff, advisors, students, professors. We'll do our best to answer your questions right as they come up. We're also gonna choose some of the most common questions and answer them all together at the very end. So what is happening tonight? We'll start with a welcome by Dean Michael Mildy. Then Associate Dean Tracy Isaacs will present a special video that she has created for you, which includes answers to your most common questions and a little bit about each program in the faculty plus some of our most favorite spot, spots on campus. After that, we will be treated to two amazing mini lectures, first by Professor Vipasha Bara, and second by Professor Joel Faflak. After we learn from them, we'll meet arts and humanities students and alumni in a guided student panel. And finally, we'll join at the very end, everybody will join you to answer some live questions. All throughout the event, all of our panelists will be answering your questions in the Q&A box, including our academic advisors, Ben Hakala and Amanda Green. We hope you'll join us for the entire event, but if you can't, no worries. There will be a recording available on our website. And don't forget to sign up for our other events. We have lots of other events coming up this spring. If you haven't attended a Next Steps presentation, we highly recommend that you do. It's helpful for everyone to understand what to do before coming to Western. We also have a special presentation about residence, if you're thinking about living in residence or if you just want more information. We have a presentation from student experience and all of the supports available to you. And we have some exciting student panels. You can find them all on our website at the same place you sign up for this one welcome.uwo.ca slash presentations. And now, before we kick off, I wanna know a little bit more about you. You're gonna see a poll appear on your screen. We wanna know, where are you from? Are you here in London, Ontario? Are you somewhere else in Ontario? Are you in Canada, but not in Ontario? Or are you joining us from outside of Canada? I'm seeing the answers come in. 73%, 78%, 84%. Let's see. I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. Let's take a look. Most of you are in Ontario, but not in London. That's great. Thanks for joining us. There are six of you in London, Ontario, right with us. And then five of you from a different province in Canada. We are so happy to have you all here. All right, second poll. Let's see. Who are you with tonight? Is it just you and your favorite device? Are you with your parent and guardian, perhaps? 
Uh, maybe your siblings or your friends are with you. Let us know who's with you. Uh, let's see, I'm seeing the votes trickling in. I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. And let's take a look here. It looks like most of you are here on your own, but we do have a few of you, about a quarter of you with your parents here. Thank you for coming parents. We love to have you. So glad you're here. All right, final poll. I know this has been a really crazy year and maybe you have not been able to visit campus yet, but we still wanna test your campus knowledge. What does Western not have on our beautiful campus? Do we not have a movie theater or a greenhouse or a statue of our president, Alan Shepard? Or do we not have a wind tunnel lab? This one, your responses are a little bit slower. I see the hesitation. I can feel it through my screen. Let's see what you know about Western's beautiful campus. I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. And let's see, most of you think that we do not have a movie theater on campus and guess what we actually do. It's right in the University Community Center, right where you live and breathe and eat and, and do all your studying and meeting your friends. What we don't have on campus is a statue of Alan Shepard. That is correct. 30% of you got that right. If you get to meet our president one day, you'll know he's a very shy guy. I think he would be mortified if there was a statue of him on our campus. All right, perfect. So now that we've gotten to know you just a little bit, I wanna get started. And I wanna introduce our Dean, Michael Mildy, to kick things off and welcome you to the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Michael, will you join me on video, please? Thank you, Day. Thank you so much and good evening. My name is Michael Milde, and I am indeed the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. And uh, I'd like to begin by thanking you for sharing some of your time with us. Normally for an event like this, I would have the pleasure of welcoming you in uh, Conron Hall, one of the truly beautiful rooms here in the university. But uh, you know, this is a year unlike any other and we are all learning how to do things differently and to make them work. So welcome to our virtual space and we will do our best to make you feel at home. I want to uh, extend a special welcome to all of the students on this call. The last 12 months have really been incredible. Uh, you have been asked to do all sorts of difficult and wonderful things, adapting at a moment's notice to changing conditions. Literally no other high school cohort before you has lived through anything like this. So I wanna acknowledge your efforts, your success, your flexibility and your resilience. You have come through and along the way, you have learned all sorts of things you never expected to have to know, like how to unmute on a Zoom call or what to do when your computer crashes and your phone's battery just died and your assignment is due and yeah. So congratulations, you are ready for university. Let's also acknowledge that this is something of an anxious time. You have important decisions to make. We know that you have questions about what the year ahead is gonna look like as well as questions about our programs and student life. Over the next hour and a bit, we will do our best to provide you with answers that will help you make your decision. And of course, we hope that you will choose Western and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. So each one of you will have your own reason for loving the arts and humanities. Uh, I know that because you're here, right? Whether it is some aspect of literature or philosophy, art, language, there was something that spoke to your interest. And we want to give you an opportunity to develop that interest and delve deeper into subjects that excite and stimulate you. We also want to want to do more than that. We want to expose you to the whole broad world of the arts and humanities by offering you courses and programs that you may never have considered, whether it is learning Latin or ancient Greek or making your own film or thinking about the meaning of race or gender. We want you to be curious, to think broadly. Curiosity is really the soul of innovation and creativity. So what makes the arts and humanities so exciting is that they ask us to consider the really, really important questions. What does it mean to be a human being? How shall we live? What does it take to be a good person? This past year with the pandemic and multiple instances of social political unrest, we've been reminded just how much we need people who are working to answer these crucial questions. As much as we all appreciate the apps and technology built into our smartphones, we know that when it comes to fundamental matters of meaning and value, an app is not going to cut it. 
You need an education that develops your critical thinking skills, as well as your empathetic imagination and your ability to communicate effectively. In other words, an education in the arts and humanities. And as part of that education, we wanna make sure that you have opportunities to take your learning out of the classroom and into the community. For over 10 years, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities has been a leader in experiential learning, internships, work integrated learning, and study abroad. It also turns out that these skills and experiences are very much in demand in the job market. Employers across Canada report that they need people who can think independently, work in groups, and communicate effectively. I want to show just one chart, mostly for the parents in the audience, which shows you just how successful NH students are when it comes to employment. Uh, there you go. You can see the numbers to speak for themselves, right? They, they tell you how well our students do six months and two years after graduations. As Dean of Arts and Humanities, I take great pride in the accomplishments of our students, staff, and faculty. We have award-winning teachers and researchers who are contributing to the creation of new knowledge and pedagogy every year. We have a small student to faculty ratio, and that means you will get to know your professors. And you'll get a chance to meet some of these individuals in the presentations that we have tonight, as well as some of our alumni. So please make sure you ask any questions you might have. We are here to provide answers. As I finish up, I wanna say a few words to the parents in the audience. I understand that this is an anxious time for you as well. You know, it's that time of, of life. There would be a certain level of anxiety even in normal times. And since the times are anything but normal, everything seems just that much harder. But your students are resilient. They have achieved a great deal in tough circumstances. And we have every confidence that they will succeed in their university studies. On our part, we are constantly working to ensure that we provide a learning environment that adapts to our circumstances and maintains standards of excellence. So finally, to the students, this is an exciting moment, a chance to shape your future. I invite you to explore broadly, ask a lot of questions as you prepare for this next big adventure. And I hope to see you at Western in the fall. Thanks very much and back to you, Day. Thank you so much, Dean Melde. Uh, that was a really great introduction. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce Professor Tracy Isaacs, Associate Dean Academic. Tracy, how are you? I think you're on mute. Are you on mute? Oh, we had it had to happen one time. It had to happen <laughs> once. So hopefully we got that out of the way early. We did. We got it out of the way. How are you doing tonight, Tracy? I'm doing all right. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to yeah. see you. Can you tell me a little bit about this video you prepared for everyone today? Yes, sure. So we have a video. Well, just let me say this. Within our faculty, we have seven departments and 14 programs. So there's really something for everyone. And tonight we wanted to touch a little bit on everything to give you just a taste of what you can expect as an arts and humanities student. And so we created a video that brings together some of the most commonly asked questions and short videos from each of our departments that highlight their programs. And uh, you're gonna get to see some of our spaces, uh, the spaces in arts and humanities that you'll be using the most. And uh, our student council has put together a little tour for you. You're gonna see an overview of University College and some amazing space where students can lounge, study, gather, however you wanna use the space. Uh, and then also, I just want to assure you that our videos were all created with physical distancing protocols followed. So any non-compliant footage is from before. So we've got a little bit of footage from a graduate, like scenes from a graduation. That's from before. Uh, and it will be from the future too. <laughs> so we're gonna also post these videos on YouTube. Uh, and social media so you can watch them if you miss anything and really want to see it again and I just can I make one more note before we start day Absolutely, at, yes. at 604 on our video we're going to be hearing about English and writing studies and there was an editing uh, issue the young woman the student who's talking about her program is named Isha Sarfraz and she's a first year student 
Just wanted to make sure you didn't miss her name. And now All we right. can roll it. Awesome. So just as a reminder, we're going to roll it now. And if you have any questions during the video, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. And this entire team of amazing people from Western will be there ready to answer your question right away. All right. And without further ado, I'm going to play that now. I am now standing in front of the concrete beach and behind that is the UCC, the University Community Center. And you'll spend some time there getting food and going to the bookstore and, and so forth. A lot of students wanna know academically, what does the first year in arts as an arts and humanities student look like? Well, it's a general year for most of the programs, you will not have specified yet what you wanna do. So your first year, is all about sampling. And then in February, during the intent to register period, you will decide what it is that you wanna study, what your major or double major or honor specialization is going to be. Being part of the Department of Languages and Cultures involves much more than just learning a new language. It means learning about traditions from around the world and understanding the way people live, speak, and think. More importantly, it means experiencing culture like you never have before. My favorite part of my undergraduate experience in the Department of Languages and Cultures was the fact that all my classes were so small and you really got some one-on-one -on -one attention from all the members of the faculty and it was a great place to meet a bunch of new people. They're always there for students if you need any guidance or help in terms of academic help or even personal help. I've had a wonderful experience. You can explore your love for languages and experience the magic of different cultures all in one place. The journey starts here. What leadership opportunities are there available for arts and humanities students? The main leadership opportunity is Arts and Humanities Student Council. You can be on the executive, you can be a representative of a department, but there are also opportunities to get involved on campus in student publications and uh, clubs. So there's lots of leadership opportunities and extracurricular activities for students at Western in arts and humanities. <music>
our academic counseling office where you can come with any concerns you have and our counselors are ready to help. This is the Dean's office. Everyone in this office, including the Dean and Associate Deans, are here to help us and want to help enrich the student experience at Western and in the arts and humanities. In between classes and want a quick pick-me-up, in the UC basement we have both a lovely hot drink machine and some vending machines for snacks that you can use your Western student card for. My program is the Honor Specialization in Creative Writing and English Language and Literature, a truly unique to Western program. You get to dive into the subtext and narratives of art and culture and how they impact society. We have the best, most caring and knowledgeable professors ever. There's something for everyone. There's so many journals for you to submit your work in and share your work with your peers, for you to read the work of your peers and to connect with them. It's a wonderful opportunity. The skills you'll develop while studying English, like problem solving and critical thinking, are incredibly transferable to the workforce or further study. They say math is everywhere, but trust me, when you come here, you see that literature of life and writing is revolutionary. We have a first year course which introduces the subject of Medieval Studies 1022, kind of starts at the beginning of the Middle Ages and talks about the rise of Christianity and Islam. Uh, today I'm teaching medieval food in my class this afternoon um, and Wednesday we're doing clothing. Last week we did the Crusades and next week we're doing universities. So it's a huge range of different kinds of things that we talk about. Students in Medieval Studies get to uh, to specialize if they want to in archaeology or history or uh, they, they go on in careers in those fields and also in law, um, teaching all of the range of things that arts and humanities students can do. here in front of University Community Center, the UCC. Students spend a lot of time right here on Concrete Beach on a beautiful day like this, especially sitting in our Muskoka chairs. And I am answering a question right now about first year entrance scholarships for arts and humanities students. So what kind of first year scholarships are there for arts and humanities students, you might ask, Sydney? Um, well, every arts and humanities student in first year gets at least $2,000 from the faculty, sometimes more, it depends, uh, and it's guaranteed if you accept your offer of admission and you're taking at least two courses on November 1st in arts and humanities. What I love about this program is the amazingly talented and enthusiastic students 
who uh, take the courses and just throw themselves into any project they're doing with so much joy and verb and energy. It's a really amazing collaborative kind of uh, space to be in. I really love being in a drama program where you can study drama, but you're also thinking about the performance side of, side of things. So being able to talk about the drama in performance, live performance, film performance, is just a fantastic opportunity. In normal times, we travel to see stuff. We go to Toronto, to Stratford, to London, to New York. Even under COVID, we have the opportunity to share the best of world theatre with our students. A lot of students always want to know, where can I study on campus? I am sitting right now in study space in Lawson Hall, which is one of the buildings that arts and humanities departments on campus are in. And as you can see, there's some comfortable space here where you can come and read or do work, set up your laptop. We also have study spaces in University College. We have a quiet room in University College. And there are lots of different options for you other than the library, though of course you can study in the library. So if you want a place to study on campus, there's lots of space for you. I will be graduating from the Gender Studies Department this year and although I'm set to go, I'm so excited for my next journey. I will be doing a post-grad in event management with a specialization in stewardship and fundraising and with that diploma, I hope to work in a women's shelter, uh, helping raise funds, running events for them to ensure that they can continue to do the amazing work that they do. By doing a gender studies module, it really set me up for this future to be able to go into a career that I'm really passionate about and I will be using my studies to help and improve those programs to ensure that shelters continue to run. I'm sitting in front of the Macintosh Gallery, which is an uh, art gallery on campus. And it's a good time to talk about creative opportunities that are available for students. If you're an arts and humanities student, the Student Council has publications for your creative or scholarly work, poetry, uh, short stories, essays. Uh, there are also specific journals within departments uh, and programs. And if you're a visual arts student working on studio, of course, your work will be part of exhibitions. You will have opportunities to show your work in the visual arts building. If theater is more your thing, then you can get involved in the summer Shakespeare production or in the theater productions uh, during the school year in French or in English. There are lots of opportunities to be on the stage or to work behind the scenes in these productions. Hi, I'm Jacques Lamarche. We're here to encourage you to consider doing a linguistic module as part of your Western degree. Linguistics is a fascinating subject. Despite using language every day, we are completely unaware of what we accomplish when we speak. That's why I like to present linguistics as the study of the things we know about language we don't know we know. An example? Well, you've never heard this little riddle, yet you know it contains three sentences which can be revealed by using the form that. Knowledge of language is unconscious and automatic. You probably have never noticed that the plural s, when it appears at the end of the word thing, is pronounced z. Intriguing, eh? Well, you can come and find out why and learn about things you know about language you don't know you know. We are standing in front of University College on the UC Hill, as it's known, the, one of the most iconic spots on campus. What do arts and humanities alumni do with their degrees? All kinds of creative things you can do with arts and humanities. <laughs> you can rollerblade. <laughs> there are any number of pathways that you can take with an arts and humanities degree. Some of our alumni go on to do professional school and become doctors or lawyers or teachers. Other of them go on to graduate school. For example, we have a recent Rhodes Scholar and a recent Gates Scholar, but we also have lots of people doing their masters or their PhDs to become professors. We also have people in the creative arts, artists and writers and filmmakers, there are any number of sectors that you can enter into with an arts and humanities degree. We've got people in the corporate world, in industry, the sky's the limit. When 
I think of the School for Advanced Studies in Arts and Humanities, or SASA, endless opportunity immediately comes to mind. The program is one of interdisciplinary freedom with massive variation in course selection and countless opportunities for experiential learning. Summer of 2020, I completed an internship with Makone Yetsu, a Tanzanian NGO that promotes the economic independence of young women. This opportunity, not possible without SASA's support, showed how many skills I've learned through the program are directly transferable to the workforce. Additionally, SASA pairs academic success with meaningful storytelling and intercultural education. The program has fostered my passions and personal growth, and I'm so excited for future students to access the unique learning experiences that SASA cultivates. I am standing in Conran Hall, which is one of the most beautiful rooms on campus, as a matter of fact, and it's in University College, uh, the main building for the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Students always want to know how big are the classes? And really, it depends. So in your first year, you might have a few classes where there are hundreds of students, like maybe 200 or 300 or even more. But you're very likely also going to have smaller discussion sections in those classes, like tutorials. And so you'll have a chance to interact and get to know some of your uh, classmates and your TA. Uh, but if if you're in writing or visual arts or even some of the other programs like languages, you might have some small classes that have 25 to 40 students in them. So it really does depend. It depends on the class. And then in your upper years, everybody will have an opportunity to be in classes with 20 or 30 students. So pretty nice size classes. We also have a very small student to faculty ratio, like about 10 to one. So if you are an arts and humanities student at Western, you will know your professors. Your professors will know you. You will not feel like just a number. You will be part of a real thriving community. I chose to study French because of the romance of the language. It's so beautiful. I love speaking it. I love reading it. I love listening to it. And we strive to conduct research and teaching in the full gamut of uh, areas of investigation. It's a decision that I'm very happy and content that I've taken. Um, parce que les, les classes ont un petit peu plus peut-être, euh, j'ai aussi eu l'opportunité de développer des, des relations avec non seulement mon professeur, mais aussi avec les étudiants dans la classe. Studying French is important, especially in Canada. There's a whole group of Canadians who only speak French. So I do hope to see you coming through our department in, uh, while, while you're at Western. Please come and join us. there definitely are opportunities for you to do internships as a Western Arts and Humanities student. Usually those opportunities are available to third and fourth year students. Some of them are program specific. For example, in SASA, all the students do an internship. And also in visual arts, there are internship opportunities. But really any student in Arts and Humanities can do an internship in third or fourth year uh, you can either bring us your own and we will review it and approve it and then you can go do it uh, and do it for credit. Or you can use the portal offered through student experience that has a host of different opportunities that will hook up students who are interested with employers who are looking for students to do internships. And those internships can be paid or unpaid. They can be for credit or not for credit. Plato thought that writing would atrophy people's minds. Well, he was wrong. Let us prove it. We offer courses ranging from speech and technical writing to fashion writing and fantasy. Most of our classes have 30 students or less, meaning more time with your instructors and more opportunity to feel part of a cooperative and engaging learning environment. Come to writing. Take some courses. We can teach you rhetoric, grammar, professional communication of all kinds, and creative writing in many different genres. Most of all, though, we can teach you analytical skills and adaptability. You'll be ready for anything. This is where you'll come if you have questions about your academic programming, if you need some help 
finding your way around uh, the university, getting accommodations perhaps if you encounter some kind of issue. So this is where you come for your main source of academic support. And one of the great things about arts and humanities is it's a small community within a large university. And so when you come to academic counseling, our counselors, Ben and Amanda, are going to know your name. Our counseling assistant, Roma, is going to know your name. And you're going to feel at home and comfortable and supported. What can I know? What ought I to do? What is there? Should I believe everything on TikTok? How should I fight discrimination? Does science reveal reality? And what is truth and reality anyway? These are difficult questions. You might be wondering, where can I study them? Well, that's easy. The Department of Philosophy. We offer courses and programs, majors and minors, exploring these and many other pressing questions, taught by award-winning teachers and globally recognized researchers. I promise you, it will blow your mind. If minds exist, that is, you can find out only by studying philosophy. Behind me is University Drive, which is the main entrance to campus from Richmond. The question is, what equipment do I need? Well, most students have a laptop. That's pretty much the main equipment that you need. It would be really hard to get by without it. It might be a good opportunity to get a new one. And you can have a fresh notebook and a new pen, and you'll pretty much be all set. You might also need some program-specific equipment, like for if you're doing studio art, you'll need art supplies. You will need uh, readings for some of your classes. You might need to buy some books. Uh, but everybody is going to tell you exactly what you need for their courses in order to do your best. In classics, we study the history, literature, and archaeology of ancient Greece and Rome, and the cultures they had contact with from about 3000 BCE to the 5th and 6th centuries CE. We have an extensive range of classes from our first year course that gives an overview of every facet of ancient Greece and Rome, to study tours to Greece and Rome and archaeological excavations at a Roman fort in England. We also have programs ranging from minors to honor specializations in various aspects of our field. These programs are often combined with others. Students study classics together with history, visual arts, and museum studies, modern languages, anthropology, business, and even classics and the STEM disciplines. This prepares our students to go on to a broad range of careers that could include law, education, business, and even medicine. So I challenge you to come and take a classics course, and I bet you it will not be the only one you take while you're at Western. I'm here to tell you how to stay informed and stay in touch with arts and humanities. So the best way is to go to our homepage, uwo.ca slash arts. That is the central hub for all the information. From there, you can find information about our programs, about our faculty members. And if you don't want to miss anything, you can sign up for our eBlast newsletter which will come to you every couple of weeks and keep you informed about every single thing that's going on in arts and humanities at Western. Hi there, I'm John Hatch, the chair of the Department of Visual Arts at Western. And I think your first visit to us, uh, you'll be impressed by the facilities. It's a purpose-built uh, structure and it's fully equipped in terms of everything from printmaking to the multimedia labs, uh, to as well uh, having our own exhibition space. Our faculty are both nationally and internationally published and uh, exhibited. The support staff is exceptional and our programs range from the Bachelor of Fine Arts to various modules in art history as well as museum and curatorial studies of which we are the only institution in Canada that offer it on the undergraduate level. I think if you come to see us and study with us in September, you will not be disappointed. All right, everybody, how was that? What a great overview. I honestly could not pick a single program out of all of those phenomenal options. And I'm kind of wondering if you are able to. Uh, so I'm gonna launch another little poll here and ask you what program or programs are you most interested in here in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at Western?
Are you most interested in classical studies or medieval studies, English and writing studies, theater, maybe film, French, linguistics, languages and cultures, philosophy maybe? Maybe our amazing SASA program or visual arts or gender, sexuality and women's studies. Let's take a look. I'm giving you a minute or two here, just a couple seconds actually, to cast your vote. And three, two, one, let's take a look. Wow, you guys are pretty evenly spread out throughout the entire Faculty of Arts and Humanities. I'm sure this is what we love to see. You can take courses in multiple disciplines. That's one of the amazing things of being a Western student. And what is great is that we do have some students and alumni here today that represent some of these areas of the faculty. So I'm gonna play a little game just to introduce them to you. Jack, Matthew, Hava, Rachel, Yasha, would you please turn your videos on and let's introduce everybody to these amazing group of students and alumni. It's a very quick game. It's called three, two, one, go. And here's how it works. I'm gonna read a question out loud and then I'm gonna count down from three. If you have done it, all you have to do is throw up a Western W. Okay, does that make sense? All right, perfect. Are you ready? Here's the first question. Have you or did you ever run into a professor somewhere on campus that was not your classroom? For example, the gym, a line for coffee, maybe at an event. Three, two, one, go. Let's see. All of you, that's right. So many of our incoming students think that Western's campus is pretty big and it is, but it's also a very tight knit community. So you can see your professors doing anything that you would do on campus as well. All right, second question. How many of you had a totally unexpected favorite course? Three, two, one, go. Oh, 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 all right, all right. Most, oh, all of you again, yes. This happens a lot because our students get to explore all sorts of different courses and different departments that they never would have, you know, thought that they would like. And then it turns to be, turns out to be one of your favorites. That's awesome. I might ask you about that later. Question three, have, how many of you have incorporated or incorporated some sort of experiential learning opportunity into your degree, like an internship or a study abroad, or maybe your president of a student council. How many of you have done that? Three, two, one, go. All right, yes, awesome. So as you heard Tracy say, we have incredible experiential learning opportunities in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, which make you an excellent future entrepreneur, employee, artist, anything you wanna be. Final questions, raise your W, if you find spoke bagels totally irresistible, three, two, one, go. I got, I got to do it too. I got to do it too. Spoke bagels are incredible. So for those of you in the audience that have not yet visited campus, when you do, one of the things that you have to do is go to the university community center on the ground floor to this place called the Spoke and get yourself a bagel. It will change your life. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Yasha, Jack, Rachel, Matthew, and Kava. We will see you again later after our mini lecture in our student and alumni panel. See you guys later. All right. So let's get our learning caps on. We have two amazing professors here today that you can all take classes from. Professor Barra and Professor Faflak, would you please get your videos on to say hello? Here we are. There you are. Awesome. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Great. Very well, Dave. Thank you. Awesome. That's great. All right. Let me start with you, Professor Barra. What courses do you teach at Western? I teach both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. At the undergraduate level, I teach global gender issues. So you learn about, you know, gender politics and governance, about um, gender and human security, gender and the global economy, and environmental issues. And I also teach those topics at the senior undergraduate and the graduate levels. Wow, that's amazing. And how about you, Professor Fafleck? What do you teach? 
So currently I'm teaching the Enriched Introduction to English Language and Literature for first year students. Um, I also teach a course on film musicals. I've taught courses on leadership. My primary fields are late 18th, early 19th century romantic literature. And for six years, I was the inaugural director of the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities. So I'm very glad to see so many people interested in SASA, but also in the Department of English and Writing Studies, um, as well as the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. That is really cool. Inaugural director. I really like that. <laughs> uh, so I heard, actually, I know for a fact, you have both prepared a short lecture for us today. Uh, professor, Professor, oh my goodness. Professor Barwa, what's your lecture about? My lecture is about um, the effects upon uh, employment and upon gender equality of disruptive technologies, such as artificial intelligence, automation, uh, robotics. Wow, I can't wait to watch that. And actually we will very soon. And Professor Fafleck, what is your lecture about? I, th I think the gist of my lecture is just simply what I always ask students. Why are you here? Why are you, why are you, why are you, why are you training yourself and what it is that you do in university? What is it about the learning experience that's most passionate for you and most meaningful for you? Which is to say, how is your education gonna serve you for the rest of your life? Quite apart from us giving you grades and evaluating you and putting you through the learning process, why does your education matter to you? Specifically with regard to tolerance and empathy. Wow, I, that's incredible. And what I love about that is that you mentioned, you know, these what you learn in these classrooms is not just about the material, it really will serve you for the rest of your life. And I love the breadth, right? The, the very different topics that really um, help us learn, be better people, really. So we're gonna play those videos now. And for all of you watching, uh, our amazing professors will be monitoring the Q&A. So if you have any questions for them, you can put it right in there. And uh, there may or may not be a little quiz afterward. So grab your notepads. <laughs> all right, professors, I will get you back on the screen a little bit later. Thank you so much for joining us to say hello. Thank you. And I will now play uh, the first lecture. How can we manage transformative change at work caused by multiple fa factors, such as technology, demographics, climate change, pandemics, and globalization, while ensuring decent work for all, as well as environmental sustainability and gender equality. These are defining questions of our time, and researchers and policymakers from various professional and political sensibilities are attempting to find answers. Navigating disruptive technologies, such as automation, artificial intelligence, and robotics, is a major challenge facing workers today. As a social scientist who specializes in interdisciplinary research at the intersections of economy, environment, and equity, I apply myself to trying to understand how disruptive technologies might promote or obstruct gender equality. In 2018, the Royal Bank of Canada published a report called Humans Wanted, How Canadian Youth Can Thrive in the Age of Disruption. The report emphasized that in the coming decade, half of all jobs will be disrupted by automation. Some will change dramatically, others will disappear completely, replaced by jobs that are yet to be invented. So how will Canadian youth prepare for the workplace of the future? I've been working on this topic with a particular focus on gender equality for the past year. And this is a very brief summary of what I've learned. There are a lot of alarmist views about disruptive technologies. No doubt we've all heard conversations or read articles about how we lose our jobs to robots in the future. But when we analyze data and trends in automation across different sectors of employment and in different world regional contexts, we find that the introduction of automation will be gradual and incremental rather than sudden and absolute. In other words, it'll be evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And it will be influenced heavily by the economic and social realities of the local context. Automation will initially affect medium and low skilled workers the most. Therefore, automation will result in a shift of the workforce 
but not in labor reduction. The demand for qualified human resources with adaptive skill sets will continue to grow in the future. In addition to economic considerations, in other words, that the economic benefits of introducing disruptive technologies must exceed the cost of human labor, automation will be motivated by environmental, health, and safety concerns. As an example, in Asian countries, COVID-19 has provided the biggest impetus for the automation of industries such as electronics and garment manufacturing. And women, who are the majority of low and medium skilled workers in these sectors, will bear the biggest brunt of this shift. People of all genders will face challenges in navigating automation. For example, globally, women hold a majority of administrative, secretarial, bookkeeping, and data entry jobs. And many of these jobs will be replaced by technology within the next 10 to 20 years. On the other hand, our analysis shows an increasing demand in foundational skills, such as critical thinking, strong writing, social perceptiveness, active listening, and complex problem solving. Global competencies such as cultural awareness and fluency in multiple languages will also be in high demand. And these are skills that workers trained in arts and humanities and the social sciences are already using quite extensively in the workforce, and they will continue to be valuable in the future. Very generally speaking, the more cognitive and variable one's job is, the more difficult it will be to automate. So things like empathy, patience, conflict resolution, active listening, skills that larger numbers of women ironically tend to acquire due to entrenched social norms and hierarchies will be in higher demand in the future. So to look at it from a different perspective, there are large numbers of men in jobs at higher risk of automation in fields such as construction, transportation, and manufacturing. So in the future, more men may want to train for careers in fields like nursing, counseling, speech therapy, education, to name just a few, that require so-called soft skills, since these are occupations that are also at far lower risk of automation. The biggest challenge for women when it comes to automation is that they are underrepresented in managerial jobs and in executive positions, which tend to be both most well-paid and least at risk of automation. Men tend to gain management experience at an earlier age than women. As you can see, even among young Canadians aged 20 to 29, an employed man is almost twice as likely to be in a management position as a woman. This early divide compounds over the length of people's careers and makes it more difficult for women to catch up. This is one of the biggest challenges that disruptive technologies present for gender equality. And if you come to Western, which I hope you will, you can learn more about what we can do to address it. Thank you very much for listening. Professor Barra, will you join me on video? That was an incredible lecture. That was completely mind blowing. And very well done. Thank you for that. Do you think we should quiz them? Do you want to see if they were paying attention? Sure. All right, let's give it a shot. So we have a little question here for all of our attendees. Which of the following statements are true? Workers trained in social sciences and arts and humanities are already using some of the human and digital skills that will be in high demand for the future. Automation will result in a shift of the workforce, but not in labor reduction. People of all genders will face challenges in navigating disruptive technologies. And men tend to gain management experience at an earlier age than women. What do you think? Which of these is true? I see some votes. We're about halfway through the voting here. I'm going to give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. And let's see. All right. <laughs> What do you think? Did they get it right? That's correct. Yes. Yes, they did. They were paying attention. They were paying attention. So what, do you think they would pass your class? <laughs> I hope so. Yes, I think they will. <laughs> That's so great. Thank you so much for sharing that lecture with us. And now we will shift gears and go into our mini lecture number two. Thank you so much, Professor. All right. Everybody got ready? Now you know that I will quiz you. And we're going to watch our second mini lecture.
So I teach a first year course in the Department of English and Writing Studies called Enriched Introduction to English Literature. So what does that course do? It covers the historical orientation of various literary periods. We're looking at works of literature in terms of genre, in terms of authorial intention. Uh, the course is meant to enrich students' research and writing skills and oral skills. It's meant to introduce students to just a love of English literature. But I also say to students, it's really important to understand that literature is also essentially a political act. And what do I mean by that? An author takes us into a world of imagination, an imaginary world, an alternative world in which we have to get out of our own hearts and minds and bodies and into the literary universe of somebody completely different. That's essentially political for me. And acts of literature are also political in the sense that they tell us something about the world that's usually sometimes disturbing, sometimes uncomfortable. And that's necessary because to lapse into a sense of conformity or a sense of comfortability about the world, and that's the kind of thing that gets us into trouble over and over again in history. So there's three works that come to mind in the course that speak out to me most powerfully. One is William Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell. William Blake, writing just after the French Revolution, uh, romantic poet, author, this is my period, um, talks about the liberation of humankind and putting the imagination to work in order to break out of religious doctrine, political doctrine, so forth and so on. And in that text, there is a moment where Blake is in a church with an angel and they descend into the bowels of the church, underneath the church, into the roots of a tree that's hanging over a huge abyss. And the angel shows Blake a vision of an apocalyptic world, a horrific world, a disturbing world, dark, fiery. And Blake is horrified by this. And the angel leaves him there, dangling in the root over the abyss. And the angel departs and goes back up into the church. And the minute that he leaves, suddenly the scene changes utterly. And Blake sees a pastoral world, a beautiful world, a colorful world, a world of his imagination that suits him far more than the world that the angel showed him. And the end of that particular section of that text, Blake goes back to the angel and the angel says, how the hell did you get out of this abyss and come back to me? Blake says, because when we were down there, I saw the world according to your perception of things. And the minute you departed, I could then see the world according to my perception of things. The world was left for me to understand and make sense of as it were. But here's the important thing. Blake doesn't dismiss the angel's perception of things. Instead, he establishes a dialogue with the angel. He has a conversation with him. And they don't attempt to resolve their differences. They don't attempt to eliminate the difference between them. Uh, they attempt to communicate with one another about their different worldviews, as it were. This is why the poem is called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, in which Blake says, without contraries, there is no progression. Another text I teach at the very end of the course is Toni Morrison's uh, The Bluest Eye. And in her afterword to that novel, her very first novel, brilliant first novel, she says this, she critiques her own work and she says, I have problems with this first novel because I think I was trying to touch my reader, but I'm not so sure that I moved my reader. And that's a profound statement for me. What's the difference between simply touching a reader, reaching out to them and moving them, which is to say moving them to action, to think differently about the world. That phrase sticks out in my mind. Another text that I teach at the very end of the course in the middle of teaching right now is Tony Kushner's Angels in America. And in that text, Prior Walter is dying from AIDS. It's set in 1985. Dying from AIDS and he's visited by an angel and the angel says to him, the angel gives him what's called the Tome of Immobility and he says, here's your chance to check out, to go back, to be eternal, to go back to heaven and not have to worry about death and pain and suffering and division and difference and everything else. Except at the end of that play, two plays together, uh, Pryor hands the book back and he says, no, 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 bless me, I want more life. I want to go back to the world of the everyday. I want to go back to the world and see if I can make a difference in it. See if I can understand all the sexual, racial, religious divisions and differences that have turned my world upside down as it were. But that doesn't mean that I want to dismiss that world. I need to go back and live in that world. Hannah Pitt, who is, uh, the mother of a Mormon in this play says, 
An angel is a belief. It lifts you up. But if it lets you down, reject it. Seek for something new. And I always want to say to my students, explore, seek for something new. Teaching literature, learning literature, isn't just about acquiring hard skills or soft skills or whatever we call them. We want you to acquire those things. We want you to, we want you to take your degree forward and we want your degree to matter for you, help you get a job, help you move forward in the world. But we want you more than that to have a sense of what literature has taught you about your life and the kinds of values that it's teaching you about your life. And above all, we want to know that literature has taught you empathy and tolerance because it's got you out of your mind, your body, your set of preconceptions into those of somebody else. It's a way of allowing you to enter into the world without any preconceptions, such that you have to figure out what it is your perceptions are going to be. And if we've done that for you, here in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. We've done our job, but more importantly, you've done your job as a citizen of the world. Thank you. Professor Faflak, would you join me on video, please? I can now. <laughs> oh, you couldn't quit you out of sharing your video. Can't, can't watch myself. Oh, 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 moving. I realized using the word moving is part of what your lecture was about. That was, that was really great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Uh, do you think we should do a little quiz? Absolutely. Uh, I need to quiz right. myself because I didn't launch myself. So yeah, here goes. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure you will know this. Let's, let's launch the poll. All right, I don't know if that actually, there we go. All right, what period is Blake writing in? <laughs> Victorian, I see there. Huh. Hands are coming in quickly. They're coming in quickly. Let's take a look here. Sec three, two, one, we'll end the poll. And let's see if I can share these quickly. All right, what do we got? 68% said romantic, are they right? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. all right. But even if, they got it, even if they got it wrong, you're welcome in my class. <laughs> That's why they need to take your class, even if they didn't get it right. That's amazing. You are all very smart out there. Thank you so much, Professor, for preparing that lecture for us. And we'll see you again at the final panel. Sure. All right. And now, enough of me. I'm going to ask Professor Tracy Isaacs to come back online. And uh, she will be leading our incredible student and alumni panel. So Tracy, over to you. You're on mute again, I think. Gosh, you wouldn't think I spend all day on Zoom. See, the thing is, I never spend the evening on Zoom. That's why I don't know what I'm doing after six o'clock. Um, okay, well, if the students could come, the students and alum could come back. So Yasha, Jack, Hava, Rachel, and Matthew. Hi, hi, everybody. I thought we would just start really quickly with each person introducing themselves and I, not to be controlling, but I'm going to name the order and we're going to start with Yasha. Oh, and what I want to know, what we want to know is um, your name, what your program is and what you're doing now, if you're alum, what you're doing now, if you're a student, just your name and what your program is. Yes. All right, I think I've got it. All right, I'll start us off. Hello, everyone. My name is Yasha. I know it's spelled Jazia, but uh, rhymes with Sasha. I use she, her pronouns, and I graduated from Western University in 2019 with an honor, honor specialization in French studies as well. And I was also part of the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities. I have, um, I'm right now, I'm working as a secondary school teacher out in British Columbia. It's great to see all of you. Great, thanks, Yasha. And Jack, please. 
Hello, uh, my name is Jack. I use he, him pronouns. I'm currently doing an honors special in English language and literature with a minor in political science. And I am in the Scholars Elective program with a few of the other students who are also in here um, in which we are doing our own independent study. Um, on, uh, on campus, I am currently the Arts and Humanities Prez, so I may or may not pressure you to join us in the next coming year. Thanks, Jack. And Chava. Hi, everyone. My name is Chava. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm doing an honor specialization in linguistics and a minor in philosophy. Um, I am sorry. I was like, what was next? Um, and then I've been involved with council, the orientation program, and a number of different clubs at Western. So kind of involved all around. Great. Thanks, Chava. And Rachel. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name's Rachel. I use she, her pronouns. I graduated in 2016 uh, from the Honor Specialization in English and Creative Writing. Um, and currently, I'm a Senior Communications Specialist for Canada Life Insurance Company. Um, so really thrilled to be here with everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Rachel and Matthew. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Matthew. My pronouns are he, him. I'm in my second year at Western, um, and my program is a double major in SASA in English language and English literature, as well as a certificate in practical Spanish and a scholar's lectures module, just like Jack. Um, and on campus, I this past academic year, I've acted as equity commissioner on Arts and Humanities Students Council, as well as the SASA department representative. Great, thank you. And we're gonna roll right into Matthew's day in the life video. Day. to get my day started. I've just woken up and I'm starting at nine because I have a bunch of errands to run today. I have a lot of meetings and work so I have to get ready. It's just like a very simple I could make a sandwich and a so singular <laughs> sausage on the side. My name's Matthew. I'm a second year student and my program in the Arts and Humanities, obviously, and my program is SASA and a double major in SASA and English language and English literature. I'm usually a lot more articulate than this. It's just way too early. And um, I'm also doing a certificate in practical Spanish and a scholar's elective module. I love my program. It's all good vibes. Everyone's super nice. Admin is really nice. Faculty is really nice. Let's come on have my breakfast and starving and then I will go to my meeting which is at 10. See you in a few. Um, so I think there needs to be funding put into that and I think there needs to be an expansion of that entire office portfolio etc whatever it may be to have people that are specifically trained to talk about racially sensitive topics with students. Okay I am back um meeting's over I showered and I got dressed um, and now I'm gonna head to Masonville to do some errands. And then after that, I have to come back. I'm gonna try to get some work done. I'm gonna try to get some writing done. And then I have a meeting. I have meetings in class from like four to 9.30. So, this class. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really looking forward to like this for the 
Tuesdays. Thank God I don't work anymore on Tuesdays. I used to have a shift on Tuesdays. But thank God I don't because my life's already super hectic. But. <laughs> The time is 8.52 p.m. This class normally runs until 9.30, but live. So, it ended pretty early today, which I'm very excited for. And, yeah, that was my day. That was the day in the life of an art student. I'm just going to wrap up my night by... I'm going to FaceTime one of my friends pretty soon. Um, just like catch up. And then I want to get some writing done. Because I'm feeling super inspired after my class, actually. Um... It is the Alice Monroe Chair in Creativity class, and this year our Chair in Creativity is Ivan Kayuri. They are absolutely incredible, so inspiring. I don't think they know how much they mean to me yet, but yeah, feeling very inspired. So that's that for my day. But before I go, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what it's like being an art student, aside from the aesthetics and like the classes. I want to talk about like the faculty and the program in general. So as an art student, you have a lot of supports. You have the student council, you have academic counseling, which is which who's there for you like 24-7. Um, you also have your amazing students that sit beside you like every day. So even though today for me was a little bit hectic, admittedly, um, it's not always that hectic. And I think being an art student really is about community, it's about expression, and it's about turning something that's very passionate and creative into critiques and analysis and making them meaningful for the masses um i think that's what it means to be an art student for me at least so thank you guys for watching my day in the life of an art and humanity student at western university and i will um see you on campus hopefully if you decide to come That was great. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew, for doing that. That was awesome. I haven't seen the whole thing all the way through yet till now. Um, okay, so we if the students could come back, students and alum, put your if you could turn your cameras on. I've got a few questions. We're just gonna cycle through them. Uh, and I will call on, I'm gonna start with Hava. And Hava, we want you to tell everybody, what is one thing you wish you knew before you started first year? Um, I think something I wish I knew would be to not be afraid to take different kinds of classes. I think in first year, I tried really hard to stay to things that I thought I was interested in or um, that I felt already pretty comfortable in the content. Um, and it wasn't until upper years that I kind of, I guess, got the courage to try classes with people I didn't already know were taking them or were in um, like different programs or different faculties entirely. Um, and you just, you always make friends with the person you're sitting next to and you'll find a million interests you didn't know you had. Um, topics can get so much more specific after high school. So even things that I thought I didn't like, I, I took a university class and it was suddenly so much more interesting. Um, so I guess that would be something. I wish I knew. <laughs> great, thank you. That's great advice. Uh, Jack, what was your favorite first year course in arts and humanities? Uh, so my favorite first year course would have to be um, English 1025 with uh, Professor MJ Kidney. Um, something that I really appreciate about that course, um, aside from just uh, Professor Kidney's energy, like that was a great introduction to the Arts and Humanities course. I walked, I was in like my lecture the first, um, like the first day, she just bounces in the room. She's like, hello, like, just like so excited to be there. Um, very, um, you know, just engaged. It was, a, that was, that's a course that you definitely cannot fall asleep in just because the energy that she brings to the lecture. Um, but something else I sort of appreciated um, on a level like speaking in terms of uh, diversity and curriculum course load is that was, um, I appreciate courses in which they do um, study like uh, literature, you know, that is like from indigenous authors, from black authors, from um, authors who are LGBTQI2+, um, because like when it is beyond just the topic of that identity. And that was something that like that course specifically did really um, well with was including that within the curriculum, you know, without simply 
just like, you know, without just having the author there, you know, to speak on their identity. And I'm really happy to see that happening in our, um, in our faculty. And that's something that I really appreciate. Um, so I would say I'd have to say that. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. And okay, Matthew, how did you decide on your major or your honor specialization, your majors? Yeah, that's an excellent question, actually. I think I have somewhat of an unorthodox experience. So coming to Western, because I'm an international student, um, of course, I did a lot of research. and I knew that I wanted to pursue English language and literature, so I was dead set on that. I think I was initially planning to do an honors spec. Um, but then as time went on and I got to Western, I heard about the SASA program. Um, and I fell in love with SASA. Just it provides so much, such a tight community. I'd even go as far as saying SASA is a family, actually. We're all really good friends. We have a group chat. It's amazing. Anyway, um, I heard about SASA and I spoke with the director of SASA at the time, Patrick Mann. And we went back and forth to make that really amazing decision. And pretty much almost before the beginning of the school year, actually, I decided to do a double major instead. And I did SASA in English. And it's been the best decision I've ever made. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Okay, this one, this one's for Yasha and Rachel, so you could take turns answering it. And the question is, uh, how do you feel your degree prepared you for your future? Sure, I'll give that one a start. Um, so I, I definitely think that I walked away with a lot of um, practical skills from this program. So again, English and creative writing. Um, since I've left the program, I've been in a lot of uh, communications roles that are very heavy on writing and relationship building, problem solving, and anal analytical skills. And you really get that from um, studying the different literature and really diving into um, writing different types of stories in the creative writing classes. So it gave me a lot of hands-on skills, but also like uh, Joel was saying, Professor Joel, um, you get a lot of that um, empathy and you know relationship building skills. So it was, yeah, a wonderful experience. On a similar vein, um, while my uh, honor specializations in French studies obviously helped me prepare for to become a French um, secondary school teacher, what I didn't expect was how the SASA program in its due to its interdisciplinary nature, it helps me bring in different disciplines into um, the French courses that I teach. So rather than um, the traditional ways I learned of like, okay, well, we're gonna learn French. We gotta do these grammar books and these grammar worksheets. And we gotta read this very specific poem that talks about the passé composé. Bringing multiple subjects that the students find interesting helps um, further my own teaching and it allows them to reach their full potential and find something that they like within the subject, even if they're not the biggest fan of the language itself. So definitely the interdisciplinary nature of the program and just the amount of creativity that you could express within it and be able to take those chances and make mistakes and try something Something new has really helped my teaching grow in this first year and I'm very grateful for it. That's really neat. I love that application of how you learn of what you learned. Um, back to Hava, how did you learn to find your way around such a big place? Um, it was definitely some Google Maps at first. I remember during the first week I was on my way to one of the O week events and of someone on my floor and I got lost and we literally googled just a map of campus and we were just so confused about which tunnel we were in um but everyone was so nice we actually just stopped a stranger at one point and we just kind of asked where the buildings were um it took a few days but honestly before the end of the first week you kind of figure out where all the buildings you're usually going to are and and kind of where they are in relation to how you usually get to campus or if you're living on campus so um, don't be afraid to look things up, but also don't be afraid to just ask somebody. I've been asked by people all the time over the past four years, um, whether they're students or someone just on campus. Um, everyone's really friendly and nice. And um, yeah, get some good steps in. Campus is pretty big. True, it is. You can really get your steps. You can also use the two towers as reference points. <laughs> Thanks for that. Okay, Jack. Are your professors approachable? I would say that they are absolutely approachable. Um, not to sort of flex, you know, because I do know that like, you know, um, there are a lot of approachable professors at Western, just like, you know, across Canada in general. But I would say that based on my perception and maybe I'm biased, the professors in our department um, and our faculty have been the most approachable. Um, I feel as though 
um, I am confident, for example, that a lot of my professors would write me a very nice recommendation letter. And it wasn't because I like tried to manipulate that relationship. It just sort of forms really naturally. And um, they are very helpful, you know, whether or not you are um, asking about something you're curious about, you like, you want some clarification, you approach them, uh, like at their, honestly, if they're at their desk and you walk up at the end of lecture and you like comment on something that they say that you want clarification on, their faces light up because they're like just, it seems as though the professors are just excited to be able to share what they're sharing with you. Um, so I've just like, I felt immediately comfortable. I already mentioned Professor MJ Kidney, who's my first prof, but ever since then, I've just had a very good lineup of just professors who I felt I could approach with um, anything, you know, like whether that was career advice or, you know, just like campus type stuff, course or whichever. Um, so TDLR, yes. <laughs> Excellent. I, oh, a T -R. I like that. I've never used that. I'm going to use that. Okay. Thank you. I learned something from Jack. Okay, Yasha, what do you do? This is a good one for you because you're a teacher now. What do you do if you need help with time management? What do I do with time management? Like, what if you need help with time? Have you ever needed help with time management when you were at Western, for example? Did you? you maybe you didn't. Did oh, anybody? At, sorry, at Western? Yeah. Or no, or suggestions for a student who might need help with time management. Oh, okay. Yes. So the there were definitely points at, at Western where I felt I was running a little bit behind. I wasn't always the most organized in high school. So I had to pick up those skills in Western during my first year. And one of the best ways of support that I found was actually on the SASA floor in Ontario Hall, having others in my cohort together to work on projects and be like, hey, can you check in on this? They're like, oh, what this was due, was this due this day or that day? And they were able to help me form a decent um, rhythm and routine that helped me keep my schedule together, especially in, and that allowed me in my fourth year, I had to end up, I had to overload on a few courses and I was able to balance the seven courses in one term just to be able to and stay on track and stay focused and find success. So I would say, well, obviously you should be picking up those skills and learning them um, throughout the program, having others to rely on in a residential community or um, even just online chatting with friends was honestly, um, it was really, really helpful. I can't believe we let you take seven courses in one term. Just everybody, we don't usually I don't, allow know. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> <laughs> don't recommend it. Sorry, I do not recommend it. Uh, no, it's a lot. That's like more than one overload. Um, and we're gonna end up. We're gonna end with Rachel. I know Matthew. I didn't go back to you because you already had all your day in the life. So we know you really well already. Um, Rachel, I wonder if you, if we could go back to the first question that we started with. What is one thing you wish you knew before you started first year? Yeah, oh my gosh, first year was many years ago for me. Um, but I honestly think like a lot of people have said, just having the courage to just embrace every opportunity. You know, I, I was involved as much as I could be um, living off campus, but um, get involved with the off campus activities if you're not living on residence. Um, you know, definitely stick around after class and chat with the professors, chat with your classmates. Um, I, I wish I would have done more of that. Um, and, you know, again, just go into it with a positive attitude and be open minded. And even if you don't really know where your program is going to take you, um, you know, just be open to to where it might take you. You know, I started out thinking, OK, I'm going to be a writer. And here I am in a, in a communications field where, you know, any industry is looking for these types of professionals. So, um, yeah, just be open minded em embrace your you're being scared and you know it's a new exciting opportunity but um so so worth it um so just embrace it excellent thank you thank you everybody that was great i, I could talk to all of you all night long and remember i'm gonna take you all out for a bagel at some point <laughs> thank you thanks tracy and thanks everybody keep your videos on just for one a couple more minutes and then our professors and our dean if you want to come back online as well uh, it looks like all of the questions that we received throughout the panel uh, were answered. So we actually don't have any outstanding questions to answer. But I do want to ask if there's anyone that has some final words of advice, you know, for a student trying to decide 
where to go for university. If you want to raise your real hand, I'll call on you. If you have any final parting words for our in future students trying to make this big, big decision. Uh, yes, Professor Fafleck. Yeah, come to Western. You just heard from the students who are an amazing group of students. Um, amazing group of students who aren't just talking to you because they're at Western, they're talking to you because they've taken in their educations and done something incredible with them and, and are still doing incredible things with them. Um, it's an indication of just what an incredible educational environment this is. So yeah, come to Western. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I like that. Come to Western. Yes, indeed. Any other final words of advice or something you wish you had known? Uh, Yasha. Yeah, it's just echoing what a lot of folks have already said, but the arts and humanities program at Western is really diverse in the courses and the different disciplines that it offers. Don't be afraid to take a course that's out of your comfort zone. That's honestly how I found some of my favorite courses with Consolga in theater and in music, um, music history. Don't be afraid to try something new. And, and when I was in first year, I tried to pick courses like, oh, I took band in high school, ergo, I must take some sort of music course going forward. But that's not the case. Please explore this opportunity. It's an awesome four years or more if you choose to stay for longer. So make the most of it for sure. Okay, Jack and then Matthew. Glad I beat you, Matthew. I'm faster. Can't beat my reflexes. Um, something else that I would mention, um, as Professor Isaacs already said, and as was echoed by a lot of um, you know, the student videos that we saw, um, this is my obligatory join Arts and Humanities Student Council. Um, it's really a great opportunity. Uh, I almost missed um, like the notification of the first year applications, and um, luckily I didn't because that has like really shaped the connections that I've made, the friendships I've made, the opportunities I've had while you know studying within our faculty. Um, and there will be specifically, I believe there should be five with our new portfolio, um, five first year uh, represent like five first year positions, so you can uh, you know get a lot of experience, and only first years can go there, so um, you know you won't have competition from all the other years. And uh, there's a lot of different pathway pathways you can take with those roles on the council that can lead you in a lot of different directions within the faculty. Um, plus, just some lifelong friends, uh, some of the best like best friends that I have now are ones whom I met through council. So just there is not a downside to joining and I would highly encourage you to keep an eye out for that. And um, perhaps I will link our social media in the chat just for some promo. So keep an eye out for that as well. Yeah, and I guess I can jump in right afterwards as well. Um, I have a similar sentiment to share, um, somewhat obligatory, but join SASA. Um, <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of people when they hear about SASA are thrown off a little bit by the advanced that's in the acronym. Um, they're like, oh, can I handle that? But I, what I have to say to that is SASA does uphold a very high standard of teaching and learning, but that high standard is to grow you and not to tear you down. Um, so SASA is a very welcoming, engaging space. In SASA, you're able to really put to use a lot of your creative endeavors and expressions, um, the props, excellent, amazing time, um, and also the community, impeccable. I said it before, and Yasha like, alluded to this as well, but we're all a really, really tight knit like family um on Ontario Hall which is arguably the best residence um we have like an entire floor to ourselves um we all just interact there I remember in my experience we had like movie nights we would all like hang out together and stuff and then when we had Sasa class we'd just be like a herd of like 20 of us walking to and from class together on campus it was just the best thing so if you're worried about making friends or if you're looking like to get into more programs within the arts and humanities Sasa is like the place that you should be looking at for sure. What incredible advice. I absolutely love everything everybody said all night long. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap it up at some point and that point is now. I know we're a little bit sad. Thank you so much for all to all of our panelists. If we were in person, I would ask for a round of applause and you would hear it. You would hear it very loudly, standing ovation. All of you are incredible and, and really provided a unique experience and perspective about what it's like to study in arts and humanities. And as we're wrapping up here, I do have one final poll. I'm sure you can tell this about me now. I love polls. So I wanna know, how are you feeling now about potentially coming to Western this September? Are you super excited? You can't wait? And, or are you still making your decision? Let's see, 71% of you voted, 77%, 82%. I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, 
one. And we're ending the poll. It looks like the majority of you are so excited. You can't wait. We are so excited too. We can't wait to welcome you. And those of you still making your decision, I am so glad you're doing your research. And I hope that you are attending sessions and you're getting all the information that you need to make the right decision for you. Thank you so much again. Thanks to those of you joining us from home, all the parents that joined your students as well. We really hope to welcome you to campus in September. Bye everyone, good night.